Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, we talk about what the heck a carry trade is and why it affected the U.S. markets recently. Stick around. That's coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Craftwork Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed. And please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. We are doing an off-cycle recording, meaning the episode you hear next week is one that we've already recorded at the time that we're doing this. And the purpose of that, or the reason that that normally happens to our show, is number one, that we are bad planners, besides the fact that definitionally our job is to plan things for people, uh, which I always find amusing. But normally it's because there's something in the news that felt topical, felt more important to kind of cut the line on what we have recorded and going. And uh, that news this week has been the return of market volatility, uh, something that really, it feels like we haven't seen this year, even though in an election year, people sort of expect volatility. They sort of expect the uncertainty that comes with not knowing where we're headed policy-wise without knowing where we're headed economy-wise. I think the politics impact is probably always a little bit overstated, but we did see a little bit of a shock to the markets this week. And so we just wanted to talk about welcoming back our friend volatility and what that means for your portfolios, how you should be thinking about your investing and uh, get into that a little bit today. Dan, how many people do you think learned what a carry trade is with <laughs> Japanese yen in the past, let's call it week and a half because of when this is going to air? Uh, I'll say millions of people, which is probably more than the dozens of people who knew about it before this past week. Yeah, I I love that that's become like the buzzword for what set this off. I mean, the reality is that it's not just because of this. There was some economic news, which in retrospect feels very, very mild. It was really a labor report um, that set this off that hiring and kind of the job opening numbers had had slowed. Um, and it looks like there are some signs that the economy is weakening a little bit, which there's a lot that we can take away from that and and that we can talk about. But then kind of the, the thing that set this off or appeared to set it off, uh, at least on Monday, was that the Bank of Japan raised rates and it set off this flurry of activity. So can we start our show by talking about what people were doing? And when I say people... I mean, hedge funds, institutional traders, not necessarily retail folks like like us that that are individual investor types, uh, but the really big shops. Let's talk about kind of what they were doing to try and generate what they thought was free yield. Right. So what this essentially is, is an arbitrage opportunity, which I spent a lot of time learning about in college, but in the real world, it's very hard to find actual opportunities for arbitrage because of how fast information flows in this day and age. But what these shops were doing is interest rates in Japan have remained very low to this point, whereas abroad from Japan, in the US, for example, interest rates have gone up. What these shops are doing, were borrowing money in Japan at very low rates and investing it for higher yield outside of Japan and basically making money on the difference. That seems like it would be an easy thing to make money on, right? If I could borrow, I mean, that's almost what being a bank is, right? But if I could borrow on my left side for nothing and receive in the United States a 45 to 5% yield, that seems like it's free money, right? Sure. Right until it's not. And so when the Bank of Japan raised their interest rates, that affected all of these people doing this, which, and again, how much of this was really short covering and, and, you know, margin call type stuff where they had to come up with liquidity and they sold stocks in order to do it. It's really hard for me to tell. Maybe somebody's got better insight into that data, but that seemed to be what set off the shock on Monday is this sense that in order to cover 
this carry trade to come up with the cash to then either close out those positions where they are kind of short the yen and long the dollar that they had to sell a bunch of other stuff, which sent the markets spiraling a little bit. Um, and that that's really what it sounds like happened. Right. And then it fuels broader panic too, right? This carry trade has nothing to do with you or me or most investors listening. But when you see a market drop like that, you feed into the panic. I logged into Facebook and saw random people talking about like, sell everything, cash on the sideline. Like that didn't apply to you. And now you are panicking as a result, uh, which can drag markets lower. Well, yeah, you, if you wake up Monday morning and you find out that Japan's major index uh, is down 12% overnight, it that's that's a big number, right? That's, that's a not insignificant economy in Japan. That's a developed market economy. So even though we are not the Japanese economy in the US, we're affected by it. And you may be invested in it. That might be part of your portfolio. But it's certainly big news to see an economy like that like if you woke up and found out that the U.S. was down 12% overnight in the futures, that'd be a really big move. Oh, yeah. That wouldn't be a great way to wake up. That, yeah, that wouldn't be a good morning. Was it the same day, by the way, that or, or the night before we learned that Warren Buffett had shed a large percentage of his Apple holdings or at least a large amount of Apple? Correct. A very meaningful amount. So, yeah, you've kind of got this. Buffett taking a bearish stance that I think it was Apple and Bank of America, if I recall correctly. He sold a bunch of stuff and has raised cash to really an incredible level. I think it's like $247 billion of cash. Yeah, like just that's, a couple pennies. That's a lot. Uh, I mean, aside from the obvious that that's a lot, it's tough to place $247 billion of cash. Like when we kind of joke about this theory that like, People that are without homes have financial trouble, and Warren Buffett has financial trouble. There isn't a person on this earth that doesn't have financial troubles. We've just got different flavors of them. And I realize that that sounds very, very ridiculous, and we would all rather have Warren Buffett-style money troubles of, what do I do with all this cash that I've got on hand? It's coming out of my ears. But truly, it is difficult to place that amount of cash. A billion-dollar company is not an insignificant company. And he could buy 247 of them on the spot. Like that, that's a lot of capital to, to try and deploy and to do so responsibly. It, it, you know, he's either really, really bearish and we've got something terrible coming, or I think he may just be having trouble getting the money to work. But uh, obviously we're, we're going to learn as, as that continues to develop. Right. And, and he still has something like 30% of his portfolio in that one company as well. So I wouldn't read too much into it, but that is a signal from an investor who, in this day and age, there are a lot of styles of investor, but Warren Buffett seems to be one who we can all rally around as having a strong track record of success and being relatively level-headed in the way he approaches things. Yeah. I mean, perhaps stubbornly level-headed, right? I mean, I, I think of... If I were in his shoes trying to explain why I'm holding so much cash and why I have been holding so much cash, right, Dan, like if we had investors in our practice where they said, we said, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to hold cash, not for weeks or months, but years, like just tremendous amounts of just sitting on your hands doing nothing. I think a lot of people don't have the patience for that. Um, it's interesting to see what he's been doing. And I also think it would be really interesting to to kind of analyze the opportunity cost of what holding that cash has meant because the market has not been insignificant, right? Last year was a good year. We're up still, even with this little pullback. You know, there is a real cost to have not earned that money. And to to use an old Peter Lynch quote that I love so much is a lot more money has been lost avoiding market crashes than even in them. And and I kind of almost view this as one of those scenarios. So I think he's giving up a lot of performance to keep that dry powder. We could look super foolish if there is a true cataclysmic event and, and he puts all of that to work in an incredibly stylish fashion where the rest of the world is on fire and he's the only one with, with uh, a hose. That, that'll be an incredible legacy. And and he has had those kinds of moves before, but um, it's a truly astounding amount of cash. 
Yeah, we shall see. But like you said, it's hard to place that much cash when you're Warren Buffett. I forget who it was. It was one of them. But they're like, I can make killer returns if you give me a million dollars to start with. And it's a lot harder when you have a hundred billion. Um, yeah. It's just the the ponds that you fish in. You know, I've also heard people in the Warren Buffett lane of investing say like, you should be ready to sit on the sideline and wait for an opportunity to beg you to invest. But that's not what the average person is doing. The average person is trying to reach you know, their personal financial goals of retirement, not waiting to smash it out of the park with a company that they've focused on their fair value and it's trading at a 40% discount. We're going to go all in on this thing with the 10th of our portfolio and exit here. You know, that's just not how most people manage their, their money. Yeah. I think there's a, I think there's something aspirational to it for what it's worth. I think a lot of people aspire to be in those types of deals and to be active in that way, but it's not a game that most of us are going to be able to win. Right. It, it like we should play games that we can win. If you spend all day, every day reading 10 K's and looking for opportunities and uh, you know, that that's different, I think, than, than, than what Warren Buffett, you know, I think most of our lives are very different than what Warren Buffett is ultimately doing um, as an investor. And, and we have great reverence for him. I think there's so much that we have learned and can learn from, from watching the way he operates and from that level of discipline while also recognizing that that's not, a style that is going to work for everybody. I think we've taken some things from from great investors across the spectrum, and I think of David Gardner of of the Motley Fool as like the polar opposite uh, of Warren Buffett, where he's a value almost as an afterthought, if if ever, sort of investor. But he's a very forward thinking, growth oriented, and that's also been an incredibly successful style. And so when you see something like Warren Buffett holding cash and raising cash. I think we have to remember how much of what we're doing can we both learn from him, but also are we not necessarily trying to mimic exactly what he's doing? Yeah, absolutely. So let's just talk about the context of how much this pullback has been. So I think the S&P's pullback is about 6%. And again, we're, we're recording this in advance of when you're going to hear it. So um, if the market continues to get clobbered for the next few days or something, maybe we've got a different result than that. But a 6% pullback in historical context is really, really normal. It's, it's one of those things where it always feels a little bit uncomfortable when it's happening. But over the last 44 years, I believe the average pullback throughout the year, so anywhere from peak to trough within the year, has been about 14%. Now, that's including years like 2008, where the pullback was like, 40%, right? So there are some outlier numbers in there, but a 14% pullback is almost one that we would call normal. I don't say that to suggest the run is going to keep going and that we're not at average yet, so we should be more scared of the current market. But I always think that the context of zooming out really helps when we think about how much is it normal to see kind of a peak to trough slide. Yeah. And the chart that you love re referencing is JP Morgan's Guide to the Markets. There's a sheet on that chart called Annual Returns and Intra-Year Declines. Let's look at last year, which is a 24% gainer for the S&P 500. We had a 10% pullback during that year as well. So you had to sit through that 10% retrace in order to finish with 24%. We're still up pretty nicely in the market this year. I would take, if the year ended today, I would take those returns every year for the rest of time if you gave them to me. But that becomes the question, right, Dan, is if if you looked at the year and said, I would be happy with this as my year, why not sit in cash between now and the end of, of calendar 2024? Well, then you have to face the, the very hard decision of when to get back in. And I mean, I started my formal career as a planner in, I want to say it was like 20, gosh, my memory, 2010 is where I entered the financial services world. And until like 2014, I was still seeing people in cash from 2008 who hadn't re-entered the market. And for all I know, they could still be in cash today. They, there was such fear of going from uninvested to invested that it's almost paralyzing because you made a call, you saw the market run up, you've anchored yourself to this point where you got out and you're like, well, that's fair value. Like, I can't possibly invest now. I'm going to wait. And you might feel better later if we saw like a 20% pullback today, maybe you'd feel like it was a better time to invest, but it still would have been better to stay invested from, from back in 2008. Yeah. I think that's the toughest thing is that re-entry point. 
is because the cost of getting it wrong is really, really damaging. And so uh, I've probably said this on the show before. I would encourage you to think in chunks, not in terms of all in or out, right? My default position as a long-term investor is a couple things. Number one, the bumps and bruises along the way, that's the entry price for for being an investor, right? Like that's that's truly what you're going to have to go through if you want good returns. I, I, I suggest that there's no good return that you'd be really excited about over the next 10, 20, 30 years without having to go through those periods. But number two is if you are in that mode where you're thinking, I've got to get some money off the table, that we don't think in terms of a binary choice, that we're not thinking in terms of in or out, but that we think in terms of a range. And so for a lot of the financial plans I do, and and maybe this is not helpful to people because it's not specific enough, but I typically suggest a range of stock exposure that makes sense. So maybe the low end of that range is that we should be at least 55% 55% in stocks because we need the growth. We need to grow our our capital and our purchasing power over time. And maybe a plan up to 85 or 90% in stocks is still sustainable and suitable. And so now we're in a range of 55 to 90 as kind of our target. So if you're in this spot where you're feeling really nervous, consider that your lower threshold, right? If you go from 90% stocks to 55 or 60 and the market keeps going up, you're not in a position where you've completely screwed yourself, right? That's really what we're hoping for there. That's still not what I would recommend. I still don't think that you should be making that market timing decision for most people. But if you're going to, if you feel incredibly compelled to do that, make it on a spectrum where it is not a full in or out, I don't own any stocks or I own nothing but stocks sort of way. Make it inside a window of what's appropriate and you're going to find yourself in a much better spot of not having to put all of that capital back to work and choose that re-entry point. I think that's a very important framework that might help you not make the big mistake, which is jumping completely off the ride. Yeah, I think that's a very good advice. And for a lot of financial decisions, they seem so binary. Should I do this or not do it? There's always a middle ground too, for many of those decisions at least, where you can feel like you're dipping your toe in the water for this feeling that you want to satisfy without going all the way and risking it being damaging to you. So let's talk about some of the other data that I think uh, has made headlines lately and is making people maybe uncomfortable or this might be part of their narrative or maybe we're just going to spread it because we're talking about it. But I do think it's part of what I read. So Jamie Dimon has come out and said he's the the head of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. His estimate on a recession is 40%. So he thinks we've got a 40% chance of creating a recession. And Goldman Sachs, based on the, these latest job update numbers, they increased their projection from 15% chance of recession up to 25 so admittedly, that is a growing chance is, is basically what some of the biggest banks in the sector and I, I follow Goldman, not even because they're as big, but I, I tend to appreciate their their angle on the research. I find banks like Morgan Stanley to be almost always bearish. Mike Wilson's like their chief investment guy. He's always very, very bearish. Even when I worked there at all times, it was, hey, you got to be invested in alternatives and hedge funds and all this kind of global macro stuff that doesn't really generate a lot of positive returns. And um, and their models, I, I think, always lagged because I think that's his view. I think they're pretty bearish at a core. But the the two calls for increasing odds of recession, Dan, do you make anything of that? Does that do anything to how you would view life for an investor today? No, I, I truly don't care. I truly don't care. Because what does it mean? Like, whether we're actually in a recession or not is so arbitrary. We might have been in one already. It, what matters is where do we go from here? And even if we do enter a recession, different sectors are going to feel that differently. So, you know, it's it's possible that many of these businesses have been living life under recessionary, like, environment already, and you've seen the impact on that. And maybe that just shifts, which speaks to the rotation we've been seeing in the market a little bit, right? That The large caps and mega caps have been getting all the love over the last few years, and we saw a hint of that shifting downward to the smaller cap companies. 
you know, it's possible that we see sector rotation or some of that asset class rotation come up, which truthfully I think would be healthy for the market. It's been like rather painful to own a diversified portfolio for the last- Watch the Mag 7 be the only thing you should own, the the Magnificent 7 companies. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I don't care. I don't care what people think about the recession. I think in general- we're going to see some sort of rate cuts happen, which should stimulate the economy. I guess it's just like, how how severe will that be? Yeah. So now the rate cut predictions are basically, I think it was like 55% pointing to like a quarter percent and maybe 45% to a 50 basis point rate cut. So now we're not even betting on if they're going to cut rates, but by how much when we get to September. So, so like literally that's where we're at. The thing I find interesting is even though this may be a little bit uncomfortable to see some of the headlines of, oh, there there aren't as many jobs open and the job market's finally softening and all this stuff. This is basically the plan, right? Like this has essentially been what the plan is over the last couple of years since 2022 when the Fed recognized that inflation is high. What's the weapon to combat that? Well, they had to basically shrink the available capital that was chasing goods, right? So like if we think on a timeline of 2020, the economy functionally shuts down. There's a bunch of, we don't want to see a financial collapse. So they push money into the economy, whether it's through stimulus programs, PPP programs, EIDL loans, like you name it, uh, enhanced unemployment benefits. We had a broader money supply. So you got more dollars chasing what should be the same amount of goods, right? By definition, that creates inflation because you've got more dollars chasing the same amount of stuff. So there's like competition for that stuff. And then you stack on top of that, that there were supply chain delays. And so getting the same stuff, that actually was shrinking. We had a shrinking amount of stuff and more money. That's a very inflation prone environment, right? That's what that's going to cause. If you create those same conditions, that's what's going to happen nine times out of 10. We've been slowly unwinding that, which is a painful process. If you've been trying to buy a home, it has been a painful process. The same home that you could buy with a payment three years ago is unattainable now, unless your income has meaningfully shifted. That sucks. I've been in that boat. But that's what the process of starting to step on that inflation, bring it back down, and they're trying to do it all while not crashing the economy uh, and, and it's a Goldilocks situation. It, it's going to be a too hot, too cold, like trying to get that right has been very difficult. I actually think they've done a decent job. I personally want to see rates drop. That would help me. That would be a good thing for me personally if rates drop before I finally close on this loan. Um, so I would love a 50 basis point rate cut, but I don't know if we're going to get it. What I would like more so than my personal wishes to be fulfilled is to see us normalize and not have to be in this incredibly accommodating or incredibly restrictive position in terms of how we've got our our money supply and and how uh, the the Fed's operating. Yeah, I think that'd be good for everyone because right now we're kind of we've been on edge for a while. It's like something's got to happen. What's going to happen? And we're all just waiting for an inclination of how much rates are going to drop, with what severity they're going to drop. And just in this holding pattern. And I, my, I always say markets hate uncertainty. And we've just been in perpetual uncertainty with a lot of noise in the background happening globally too, by the way, which may or may not influence the businesses we're investing in, but certainly change the way we feel about it. Yeah. I mean, to go back to your comment, Dan, of, of not caring if there's a recession, I, I think the other key is to remember that businesses are forward thinking, Right. The very reason the job numbers may be soft is that businesses have been worried and not hiring as many people. That is the cause of a recession, but it's also forward thinking management in these companies, right? That's that's almost what we're asking of them as investors is we're going to be a shareholder. We are expecting you to make good decisions. We are expecting you to forecast your business and the things that are going to affect it, and to have a finger on the pulse of your business, if you're choosing to slow your hiring, that is what we're really looking for. And and so I, I do think even if there is a recession, that doesn't necessarily mean that business is going terribly. It means that the people in charge of those businesses are trying to steer their own ship through the water. 
just like we are as individuals dealing with our finances and trying to navigate through some of these same decisions. But more often than not, panicking is almost always a bad option, right? Selling into a slide is a very bad option in most cases. The one thing that I would walk that back, just because we're always talking out of both sides of our mouth on this show, that, that's kind of our, our whole shtick, is if you're nearing retirement, if retirement is in the next couple of years and you've been all in stocks because you've been enjoying the party, it's time to take a look. It's time to take a look at that allocation to understand what you're going to be spending over the next couple of years. That's how we plan so that we don't have to worry about what the market's doing. So that's the one spot I would say, if that's you, if you're listening to this going, oh crap, he's talking to me, then yes, you should take your foot off the pedal and you should treat what happened uh, recently as a foreshock so that you don't get caught really in a bad situation. And that's not me pre predicting a bad market situation. It's simply what's prudent if you're getting ready to need to spend the money. Right. And, and consider yourself lucky too, because what happened, I don't think was very severe. It, it was just very quick. We saw a couple days of like pretty intense downside. It's walked a little bit of that back already. It just happened very fast. Yep. So, you know, whatever, 6% drawdown over a couple months is nothing. You just felt it in like a week. So, uh, you know, just. Dan, have you still. seen the chart of what the VIX did? Oh, I saw, I saw that chart. That was yeah. pretty. It, because the, the VIX spike made it look like it was one of the worst economic events that's ever happened. Like it spiked as high as it did in some real crisis situations. Um, and the VIX is just a volatility indicator. It's not really a things going bad indicator. Um, right. Now, volatility normally accompanies things going bad, which is why people use it as a surrogate. But I think that's another example where the data point may not tell the whole story because I certainly don't think we've had calamity that at an unprecedented level, it was just a very high volatility day. And it was a bit of a surprise. Yeah. The best thing to do always is just not make it daily habit to look at your accounts. If you're concerned with what's happening day to day, you've done something wrong. You know, we invest over long term periods. And if it don't have a long term, you should not be an investor for that money. Let's leave it on that. That's a that's a great way to wrap up, Dan. I like it. Yeah. If it's not long-term money, it shouldn't be invested in the market anyway. Um, next week, we've got a mailbag episode coming out. We are excited to share that with you. Thank you to everybody that has written into the show with your questions. Check your balances at outlook.com is the email address on how you get a hold of us. You can also check us out on Instagram or all the other uh, spots on YouTube comments, all of that stuff. We are always appreciative of our fans that write in, have questions for us, and give us a reason to keep doing this show. So thank you all. 